Good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us on Facebook today. I'm here joined with Dr. Aldo Londino. He is a pediatric otolaryngologist at the Mount Sinai Health System. He treats uptown at East 85th Street and also in Staten Island on Richmond Road. So welcome and thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Thanks for coming here. on board. So today we're gonna to talk about speech delay in children specifically. So let's talk about first, how do we define speech delay in children? Okay, so, um, you know, generally I see a lot of kids in the office who have a speech delay, and uh, we define it a variety of different ways. Basically, if you're not meeting your milestones based on your age, we start to get concerned. Um, from a speech-related standpoint, if you're a year old and you don't really have any clear words yet, you should have maybe a couple, um, 15 months at the latest. If you're two and you're not putting sentences together, three, no three-word sentences, we have a variety of milestones that we use to help gauge where a child should be in terms of speech development. Um, and generally, when we identify children who are at risk, um, we do some specific testing for them. Specifically, in the ENT's office, we do a full evaluation of the child, we do an examination of the ears, and that includes a hearing test. Okay, let's rewind first before the testing gets involved. How do sure. parents actually know if they don't know those milestones? What simple cues can they take to say, yes, there might be a problem here with my child? Yeah, so generally they take cues from the pediatrician and frequent visits with the pediatrician are helpful and they can kind of weigh in and say, well, about this time your child should be doing this or other children the age of your child should be doing this. And that is really a bell curve. Some children develop a little bit earlier, some children develop later. I like to tell parents that Einstein didn't have words until he was around three years old. Um, but in general, we have some guidelines, like I mentioned, that, that help, um, help us navigate when to refer children, when to start um, treating children. And we tend to err on the side of um, testing earlier rather than later so that we catch the kids a little bit early that might be falling a little bit behind. But again, so if your child is around the age of one, um, isn't saying mama, dada, simple words, or near the age of two and not, you're not hearing a couple word sentences or has less than maybe 25 words, that's generally when we start to be a little bit more concerned about um, an underlying speech delay. Great, and what are those underlying causes of speech delay? So there are, there are a variety of causes um, of speech delay. Um, one of the big ones that we see a lot of here is hearing loss. You really do rely on normal hearing to interpret the world around you, to learn um, speech and language, to help with pronunciation as you get older, clarity. Um, so if you are if you are suffering from a hearing loss, which many kids suffer from, from ear infections, from um, underlying issues uh, related to their ears, that can really set you back a bit in terms of learning um, for mom and dad who are talking to you. So if you're hearing the word ball, but you're hearing ba instead, you'll repeat it that way, right? And um, it can affect your vocabulary and your pronunciation. So hearing loss is a big one. Um, other unrelated developmental issues, things like uh, uh, spectrum disorder, autism, things like that, um, cerebral palsy, issues that can affect uh, the motility of the tongue and, and how you're able to form words uh, can set you back. So all of these things are, uh, are problems that we evaluate and look for here. Um, we work together with the audiology team and with our speech therapy team and with the pediatrician to try to hone in on, in on the cause and see if we can um, identify that and then treat it appropriately. Right, so let's go back to the testing. What can parents expect, A, of the first visit, and B, of the whole testing process for the child? Sure, so the first visit, we generally kind of get to know each other, and I get a feel for how things are going, and um, I take a full medical history and do a full exam uh, of the child, specifically focusing on things like um, the ears, the tongue, is there a tongue tie, is there ear fluid, uh, things that could help uh, identify, for me, a possible cause. And generally in the same day, we do a hearing test with our audiology team here in the office. Um, and then we get really good critical information about how well the child is hearing. Certain age groups can be a little bit tougher to test, uh, but for the most part, we get some good data about, um, about how the child is hearing. And then based on that, um, you know, we make a decision about, about where to go from there, either re referring back to the developmental pediatrician or downtown to our New York, um, uh, the infirmary downtown where we do a lot of our uh, more uh, advanced and formal hearing testing. Um, okay. But yeah, so from the first visit, it's, it's a good conversation about how things are going. We focus on the parents' concerns. Um, you know, I tend to really rely on the parents to give me that critical information. Um, and, you know, 
uh, especially when it comes to speech delay, we take any and all concerns very seriously because like, like I said, we really want to catch things earlier rather than later. Absolutely. So let's talk about that whole process of once you do determine what is happening with the speech delay, you generally have an idea of the genesis of this. What happens next with the treatments? What are the treatment options? Sure. So um, if we identify a speech delay and we also have a clear cause um, that, let's take hearing loss for instance. If you have hearing loss related to ear fluid and you meet all those guidelines for us to intervene, um, we will we'll either intervene in the child in a way that maybe we'll place ear tubes and then um, we'll retest the hearing, the hearing improves and we expect the speech to kind of com come along with that. Okay. And we see that often where kids have some kind of an intervention and then afterwards the parents notice there's a big pickup in terms of how they're responding. Some of these kids are already in speech therapists and the therapists will reach out and say, oh, that was great, thank you so much, made a big, made a big difference. It's terrific. If there's issues related to tongue mobility, then we can also tack tackle that problem. Um, and we, we treat tongue tie repair, we refer out to, we have a very good speech therapy team uh, that helps with exercises and tongue mobility and um, uh, you know, consonant and vowel pronunciation and the whole works um, working in conjunction with us to help um, from a therapy standpoint get the child where they need to go. So it's not always a surgery that we do that gets kids where they need to go. It's more important that we have kind of that team-based approach. And sometimes it's just care. speech therapy, correct? Yeah. Speech therapy alone can sometimes be very, very beneficial. That's uh -huh. nice to know. Yeah. Let's talk about the tongue tie, a little bit of controversy going on with that. Can you explain to our viewers sure. what it is? So um, a tongue tie, the medical term being ankyloglossia, is basically where the tongue is tethered to the floor of the mouth in such a way that it can create problems for feeding in our infants and um, there's concern that it might lead to a speech delay because that decrease in tongue mobility makes it difficult to pronounce and form words. Uh, there's controversy because uh, recently we've seen many, many, many more kids with tongue tie. They're being referred. And that's probably because um, there are many more um, practitioners that are referring those patients. There's kind of a heightened awareness about it nowadays. So lactation consultants, uh, nursery room nurses, pediatricians, um, speech therapists, we're getting a lot of referrals for different, from different specialists. That said, our medical literature about how to tackle the problem of tongue tie hasn't really caught up with, with us yet. So we don't have that really strong, robust data that tells us uh, you know, uh, that tongue tie repair is, is really helpful, speech therapy alone is really helpful, maybe doing nothing and seeing how the child does, exactly, exactly when and where to intervene. So. Um, we basically we rely on a very kind of individualistic approach to patients if they're really having problems, if there's clear limited mobility, and we talk to the parents about the risk and benefits of all the different options to see if that's gonna be an effective way to treat their speech therapy. Um, but it is something that we, we evaluate and, and, um, and we see commonly here. And around what age does that occur? Well, generally it's right around birth when we notice that there's difficulty with either latching during breastfeeding or or taking the bottle or breastfeeding can sometimes be very painful. And then again, we see another surge around age one and two when we realize, oh, there's a little bit of a speech delay, maybe it's related to this, to the tongue being problematic. But I really we do really see kids of all ages can present with a problem, but those are really the two main age groups where we see a bunch, a bunch of kiddos. Okay, and in fact, that could even happen with adults, right? Later yes. on in life that have never been treated for it. Yep, Okay. And we do see that. All we right. So another question, you talked a little bit about the approach at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that holistic patient care? You get to see everybody all at once and what differentiates you? So basically, the way that we try to, to, to treat um, speech therapy here, um, it's a very team-based approach. So we communicate a lot with our, the pediatricians, with our hearing, um, our audiology specialists, the speech therapists from the community and the speech therapists at Mount Sinai. Um, because I really do think that effectively managing this problem, it has to be kind of a team-based approach. You need to be constantly updating and getting feedback about how your treatment's going, about big changes. Uh, there are a lot of variables that go into the effective treatment um, of these kiddos. So I think the, the focus at Mount Sinai is always really to get everybody in the room together. You know, you get you see me and then you see our hearing, our hearing team specialist at the same day. So we get that data right away um, to help kind of streamline care and make sure there's not a delay. Because like I've, I've already mentioned a couple times, but Speech, speech delay is one of those things you really want to target early because there's a critical window, six months to about two years, where the, uh, the children are really learning quickly. And you want to make sure that they're really meeting their potential so that they can benefit from, um, you know, 
conversing with mom and dad, speech therapy, dinner, speech, dinner, and speech therapy, you know, communicating and understanding and experiencing their environment. So having that team-based approach, I think you really don't miss much. Excellent. So you have multiple excerpts weighing into their care, and then the earlier the better is the critical takeaway here. So another difficult question for you. How can patients reach you if they want to reach out for an appointment? Sure. Um, so you can reach out to me either through our office number. Um, I see patients at our 85th Street office, and the number is 212-241-9410 to make an appointment to see me. Um, or you can also go through the website, www.mountsinai.org backslash peds, E-N-T. Um, those are kind of the two, two big ways to get to me. Excellent. And you have a Staten Island office as well? I do. I have a Staten Island uh, office on um, Richmond Avenue. We're starting to see patients there every other Monday. Terrific. Multi-boroughs. Yeah. We're all <laughs> over the place. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much for being here today, Dr. Londino. Thank you so much. And thank you all.